Muscat admitsi mejdana Malta der SPV for corruption. When Labour stepped into power in 2013, the so-called oil scandal at Anna Malta was relatively fresh. The revelations came out of investigations by Xavier Balsan's Malta Today that led to the prosecution of the government-appointed chairman of Anna Malta, Tancred Tabone, among others. They were accused of taking kickbacks paid by the local agent for the oil supplier, and they were faced by the prosecution's witness, the agent himself, who had been pardoned to testify against those involved. The story came to light, like most stories do, because the supplier's brothers and business partners were left out of the corrupt deal, and felt that since they could not profit from the illegal trade, they might as well disrupt it. Their lawyer was one of Labour's election candidates, and the story came out. If there is any disappointment from this, it is that the cases in court still drag on, demonstrating the country's unwillingness or inability to deal swiftly and properly with corruption. The government does not help. The state's witness in the oil procurement prosecution said he had given gifts to Ray Ferris, an Anamalta official responsible for purchasing oil. You'd expect someone like that to be kept away from public service for life. But when Conrad Mitzi was tourism minister in 2019, Ray Ferris got a job as head of enforcement and compliance at the Malta Tourism Authority. So much for setting the example. Given the noise Labour had not unreasonably made over the funny business at Anamalta under the administration that preceded them, one would have expected them to make sure Anamalta becomes an exemplary model for good governance. Enter Conrad Mitzi, Minister for Energy. What he was doing behind the scenes from his very first days in office has been known since the Panama revelations in 2016. But we often miss what's right in front of our very eyes. Conrad Mitzi made Anamalta the special purpose vehicle for the government's corruption. Technically, Conrad Mitzi stopped being the Minister for Anamalta in April 2016 when he was symbolically removed from that ministry after the Panama Papers confirmed what Daphne had reported in February of that year. But he remained a minister within Joseph Muscat's office. Joseph Muscat took over ministerial responsibility for Enemalta and assigned Conrad Mitzi the special project of the new power station. The change was transparently cosmetic. After the June 2017 election, Joe Mitzi was appointed minister for Anamalta. Again, the gesture was symbolic. Joe Mitzi was always out of his depth and just grateful for being allowed to pose for pictures. He was a figurehead in his ministry, which was run remotely by Conrad Mitzi. In January, Roberta Bella appointed Michael Farrugia to the ministry responsible for Anamalta, leaving both Conrad Mitzi and Joe Mitzi out of the government. But Michael Farrugia is himself a very close associate of Joseph Muscat, who helped the interests of the corrupt cabal running the country when he served as police minister. He has continued to do so under Robert Tabela. During the years 2013 to 2019, the scandals never stopped. The government started as it meant to go on, pardoning in 2014 1,000 business operators who bribed the Malta officials to tamper with electricity meters. Impunity would be institutionalized. Conrad Mitzi adopted the unorthodox and, as would turn out, corrupt style of direct intervention in major contracts. In 2015, he landed in hot water with the Auditor General, who criticized Mitzi's interference in a hedging deal with Azerbaijan's Sokar. The Auditor was scathing. The decision-making process was not transparent and records could not give assurance how much the expert committees actually decided and how much they were fronting for what Conrad Mitzi, through his interference, actually closed in deals behind closed doors. In May 2016, Daphne Caruana Galizia would expose Nexia BT for arranging offshore setups for Cheng Chen, an Accenture official who negotiated with the Maltese government the purchase of a stake in Anamalta by Shanghai Electric. The revelation was a strong indication that the part privatization of the energy company was a rotten deal. 
In the process, the government removed the Malta from the statute books, abolishing parliamentary scrutiny over its finances and opening up a greater than ever opportunity for corruption. The next CBT connection with Cheng Chen was significant because just a few months before this discovery, we learned next CBT also set up offshore companies for Keech Cambry and Conrad Mitzi, and for a third person that the then magistrate Aron Bujeya ruled was not Joseph Muscat. In parallel with that, Nexia BT was also working on lining up Enemalta for its biggest buy, a massive energy deal for the next 18 years. Nexia BT were hired by Conrad Mitzi to draw up the terms of the project, which they, not experienced Enemalta engineers, designed. Nexia BT then led the selection process that handpicked Jorgen Fenex Consortium with Azerbaijan for one of the most lucrative contracts ever in public procurement history. They did that even though they audited the accounts of the holding company owned by Jürgen Fenech and his Maltese partners from the Kazan and Apa Bologna families. That's enough of a scandal you'd expect. It was documented in detail in November 2018 by the National Auditor who wrote a damning indictment of Konrad Mitzi's conduct. Konrad Mitzi rightly assumed most people would not read the auditor's report and claimed the NEO had certified his meddling and the corruption behind it as some sort of best practice. Of course, the opportunities for corruption created by the electric gas deal were endless. Anamalta was supposed to buy electricity from Electrogas, and the Electrogas would make its own arrangements for the fuel it needed. Electrogas would purchase gas from one of its mother companies, Azerbaijan state-owned company Sokar. But weirdly, the deal with Sokar was not signed by Electrogas, as you would expect, nor even by Enamalta. It was signed by Konrad Mitzi himself. That detail blew away investigators at the Financial Intelligence Analysis Unit, the FIAU. That thought they had seen enough for the police to fall hard on Konrad Mitzi. Remember that in 2015, the auditor had already noted that Konrad Mitzi's backroom dealing with Sokar were out of order. That, as it turned out, had just been the start. The police obviously did not act. Instead, we would learn that the Konrad Mitzi deal with Sokar would force us to pay for the raw material cost of our energy consumption, double, treble, orders of magnitude up to seven times or more over market rates. And that would not be enough. Suppressed FIAU investigations would also find compelling evidence that kickbacks were intended for and possibly paid to Conrad Mitzi and Keech Cambry on the back of the procurement of the gas tanker permanently berthed alongside the power station in Birzabuja. Yet another corruption scandal. There would be scandalous spin-offs too. Nexia BT would inevitably feature again. The deal with Streamcast cost taxpayers 5 million euro for seed investment into what turned out to be a swindle. In the meantime, Nexia BT cashed in on advisory and advertising fees as a chunk of Enamalta's financial resources was squandered. And now we learn of the scandal in Montenegro. This website reported earlier today that official documents filed in Podgorica say Anna Malta paid 3.5 million euro to purchase the shares into the company owning the wind farm. But Anna Malta's own accounts say they spent over 10 million. And that's no accounting error. Reuters and Times of Malta revealed that Jorgen Fenech 17 Black made 4.6 million euro in profits simply by funding the flipping of the company from the original Spanish owners to Anna Malta through S.A. Shed's company owned by his Azerbaijani partner at Electrogas, Turab Muzahev. How can such rot persist? Mostly by using Anna Malta as a den for trusted accomplices. Throughout this time, right to the present day, Anna Malta's board secretary was Aron Mifsud Bonici. Incidentally, he's also Konrad Mitzi's personal attorney and the guy dotting the I's and crossing the T's on the Montenegro deal. Anamolta's board was headed for many years by Frederick Azzopardi, replaced by veteran director Kevin Kirkop, when Azzopardi was moved over to the Rhodes Department. 
but the wheeling and dealing doesn't always and only happen inside the chairman's office. The flimsy moral fabric of an organization is weakened and stretched by poor recruitment, decisions taken by politicians from outside the organization. Consider the case of Daniel Zamit. His father is Ray Zamit, one of the revolving door police chiefs under Labour, whose claim to fame is his bovine reaction to Police Minister Manuel's Mal- Ma- Juan Manuel Malia's driver speaking to him on the police radio, saying he had just fired his sa- sidearm at someone on a highway because he drove too close to the minister's car when the minister wasn't in the car. Famous last words in office. Okay, see me. Daniel Zamit was a banned cop. He was pensioned of the police force after Daphne Caruana Galizia revealed Zamit had bought a villa in Hattard way beyond the means of a police officer. But he wasn't altogether wasted. From the police force, Daniel Zamit was moved to Enemalta to work with people he had investigated and prosecuted for taking bribes, for tempering with smart meters when he was still in the blue uniform. Here's another one. Remember Raymond Aquilina? Let me jog your memory. In February 2020, he was superintendent at the police department and testified at the public inquiry into the killing of Daphne Caruana Galizia. He said he had worked at the anti-money laundering squad since 2009. He was asked by the inquiry to explain why his department had not done anything about the FIAU reports into Conrad Mitzi. He gave bureaucratic answers about pushing files here and there and hearing nothing of them after a while. He claimed not to have read hot reports with evidence against senior figures in the government. A few days after that testimony, Raymond Aquilina quit the police force after a service record of 34 years. His name would come up again. Recordings made surreptitiously by Melvin Teuma show the conspirator in Daphne Caruana Galizia's murder, who has since turned state's evidence in the case, was forewarned to expect his own arrest. He was told that he would be arrested on charges of money laundering and that he would be interrogated by Raymond Aquilina. Melvin Temo was, not, was told not to worry unduly because Raymond Aquilina is all right, meaning he was on the side of criminals and would release Melvin Temo after going through the motions. Raymond Aquilina may have been warned to expect recordings suggesting criminals considered him as friendly to them, would emerge in court and left the police force quietly as a result. Where did Raymond Aquilina go to work after he left the police force? Probably in anticipation of his disgrace. You've guessed it, Enemalta. This makes the energy company an effective refugium peccatorum. Ministers like Konrad Mitzi, involved in and profiting from corruption at Enemalta, needed the right people on the inside. And the part privatization of Enemalta, rather than ensuring the entity would be more independent of government control, reduced the checks and balances that existed, including parliamentary scrutiny, to give Konrad Mitzi a free hand. Significantly, Enemalta's directors are falling short of their obligations as directors of a publicly listed company to provide shareholders with detailed and consistent information regarding their actions in response to the details that are emerging about wrongdoing in the Montenegro imbroglio. The directors have only responded to questions when these have been solicited by journalists or the NGO Republica and have taken no initiative to keep the public informed. There may be another reason for that. An Amalta spokesman is Robert de Brincat. He was not a police officer before working for the energy company. He was editor of L'Orizzonte. Makes sense. 